Hello, welcome back to Tripoli 41. This is lecture 8 where we'll introduce semiconductor diodes and see how they are used and analyzed in circuits. After dedicating our first few weeks on semiconductor fundamentals, we will now discuss the first semiconductor device in this course, which is the diode. We'll discuss the diode's structure and the shock the equation, which models the diode's IV characteristic under DC. After that, we'll introduce simple diode circuit models to help us analyze diode circuits, and we'll also look at common practical diode circuits. Our objectives for this lecture are the following, to analyze circuits using diode equivalent circuit models and introduce diode-based logic, wave shaping, and power circuits that use these diodes. Okay, let's start. So, diodes are two terminal electronic components that allow the conduction of current in one direction only. The electrical symbol for a diode is the one shown on the right with the two sides being identified as the anode and the cathode. There are other symbols for different kinds of diodes, but we will just go with this generic symbol first. First, we have PN junction diodes under the different kinds of diodes. Um, these are created when interfacing P-type and N-type semiconductors, and thus the name PN junction diode. In a PN junction diode, the P side acts as the anode, while the N side acts as the cathode. PN junction diodes work by diffusing majority carriers through a depletion region in forward bias. We'll learn more on this on the next few slides. Next, we have metal semiconductor diodes, or also called Schottky diodes, which work by thermionic emission of majority carriers over a potential buyer at the metal semiconductor interface. In a Schottky diode, the metal and semiconductor can act as the, met, the semiconductor can act as either the anode or cathode depending on the semiconductor type. In an n-type MS in an n-type Schottky diode, the metal acts as the anode while the n-type material acts as the cathode. Whereas in a p-type MS contact or Schottky diode, the P side acts as the anode, while this time the metal acts as the cathode. We also have other diodes which include LEDs, tunnel diodes, PIN diodes, where I is stands for intrinsic, um, laser diodes, and so on. Some of these are still made of semiconductor materials but with special characteristics and dimensions. For this lecture, we'll focus only on the PN junction diode. For an overview of, PN, of how PN junction works, consider a P-type semiconductor suddenly put in contact with an N-type semiconductor. Before anything in the figure, before anything um, in the figures in this slide, we'll use hollow circles for holes and shaded circles for electrons shaded squares for ionized acceptors, and hollow squares for ionized donors. Note that both hollow circles and squares are positively charged, while both shaded circles and squares are negatively charged. Now, since the p-type has more holes, then the holes will diffuse to the right. There are more electrons on the N side, so the electrons will tend to diffuse to the left. On the other hand, the ionized dopants are immobile and will stay within their original lattice sites. The carriers will continue diffusing with the holes diffusing to the right and electrons diffusing to the left until the PN junction has reached a thermal equilibrium. Now, how was the PN junction able to achieve this? As the holes from the P side diffuse into the N side, they become minority carriers and recombine with the many electrons on the N side. The electrons on the N side 
um, that diffuse into the P side also recombine with the many holes present on the P side. And thus, at the interface, a depletion region is created where there are very few carriers. Note that within the depletion region, the dopant atoms, the ionized acceptors and ionized donors, stay in their place. Thus, the P side becomes net negative with a deficit of holes, while the N side becomes net positive with a deficit of electrons. Thus, a built-in electric field is created which pushes carriers away from diffusing further. In this case, um, the carriers will still diffuse but is now balanced with drift such that the effective holes and um, effective hole and electron currents are zero. So if we focus on this P side, holes will still diffuse towards the right, but since the electric field is leftwards, then at this point they will drift back leftwards. And recall that at equilibrium, Jn and Jp are both zero, with carrier diffusion and drift currents at equal magnitudes but opposing directions. Um, the built-in electric field is, direct, is directed from the net positive N side to the net negative N side, uh, P side. Now, if we apply some voltage to enhance the built-in electric field, say we make this electric field leftwards stronger, then we are putting the diode in what we call reverse bias. Um, and in, in these conditions, carriers are prevented by the electric field to cross. So holes are still being pushed back and electrons are being still being pushed back. Thus, in, um, in this reverse bias, um, there is very minimal current from its equilibrium value. However, if we apply some voltage that tends to oppose the electric field, the built-in electric field either make it weaker or overcome it, then we are putting the diode in quote-unquote forward bias condition. In this state, carriers are now able to cross the depletion region and current can flow. This explains how APN junction allows current to flow only in one direction but not on the other. And that is from P side to N side. The Shockley diode equation describes the current through a diode given a bias voltage and models the diode to have some exponential IV characteristic. The Shockley diode equation, that is this equation where ID is equal to I0 times E raised to VD over VT minus 1, um, uses I0, which is the reverse saturation current. This I0 is a function of the doping concentration, the material such as the dictate, e.g. tau, mobility, etc. Also the temperature and um, dimensions. So aside from Vt, which is the thermal voltage, I0 as well um, depends on the temperature. So again, Vt is the thermal voltage equal to Kt over Q, where Vt is 0 0.026 volts at room temperature. So now um, Vt is in volts, Kt over Q, whereas if it is Kt only, then that is in electron volts. Now, before we use this equation, it must be clear to us what is the notation for this Id and Vd. The default notation for diodes is shown here. ID enters the anode and follows the same direction as the arrow in the symbol. Uh, 
while the positive terminal for VD is at the anode. If we plot this function, uh, we note that VD values above VT can easily overshadow the minus 1 term because this is an exponential. And therefore, in those cases where VD is uh, much greater than VT, then this term here approximately is negligible. And therefore, approximately ID is exponential. And that is when the diode is forward biased. However, for negative voltages under reverse bias, um, the exponential term approaches zero, so e to the minus infinity is zero, and we are left with the minus one. And thus, this explains the name reverse saturation current as ID will approach this value at reverse bias, negative I naught. So that is some small negative current. Using the Shockley equation in large circuits or circuits with a lot of diodes can be quite challenging when doing circuit analysis by hand. We'll see in a short while how we can approximate the behavior of a diode using simpler circuit models. But before that, let's have a quick review of IV curves. Starting from resistors. Now, um, since resistors follow the Ohm's law, where I is proportional to V, then we have this linearly increasing plot that crosses the origin since when the voltage is zero, the current is zero. For DC current sources, um, since the current must be constant regardless of the voltage, and since the y-axis is the current, then the IV curve must, must be a flat horizontal line. Um, that crosses the y-axis at the value of the current source. For voltage sources, um, the voltage must be constant regardless of the current. So we have this vertical line that crosses the voltage axis at the value of the voltage, say, VDC. What then are the IV curves of an open circuit? and of a short circuit. For an open circuit, the current is always zero regardless of the voltage. So we can draw this flat line which represents zero amperes. For short circuit, the voltage is always zero regardless of the current. So we draw that as a vertical line that crosses the origin at zero volts. Let's model what we call an ideal diode. An ideal diode perfectly conducts in the forward current direction and perfectly blocks current in the reverse direction, meaning when the diode is on or what we call the forward bias um, condition then the ideal diode acts like a wire or a short circuit allowing the current to flow uh, regardless of its value however um, as we have just mentioned in a short circuit the voltage is always zero while the current can be anything and that's a perfect vert vertical line. However, um, the perfect or ideal diode will only allow current to flow in one direction from anode to cathode. So we draw the IV curve for a short circuit, but only on the positive side. Thus, there is another condition that if the ideal um, diode is forward biased, then ID must be greater than or equal to zero only. So that will not have any current at this part. 
On the other hand, when the ideal diode is off, or what we call reverse bias, then the diode must not allow current or act like an open circuit with I is equal to zero. However, this only happens when the diode is fed with a reverse voltage. And so we draw the IV curve only on the side where VD is negative. And thus, we also have this condition for the reverse bias case where VD must be negative. The ideal diode model is useful when doing quick analysis of how currents will flow in a diode circuit. It is also useful when you expect very small voltage drops in the diode relative to your voltage supply or other voltages in your circuit. However, um, the voltage drop in a diode in a large number of cases is not negligible and must be considered. If you may have also noticed the forward bias plot of the shock key of the shock Lee and the ideal diode model differs significantly. So here we have the ideal diode curve and here we see that there is considerable difference in the voltage. Now to come up with a more realistic result without complicating the required analysis, a constant voltage drop model is normally used. In this model, the forward bias the forward bias line is slightly adjusted such that the curve for the on characteristic of the diode now crosses the x-axis at some value vf, which is closer to the curve at the expected range of currents. So here we see that our model is closer to the actual diode curve. However, only positive current must flow, so the line does not go into the fourth quadrant. So we do not allow that to happen or is not covered by the model. So we still have this condition that ID must be greater than or equal to zero. This forward voltage VF is also referred to as V on or V gamma in other texts. Now the reverse bias portion remains relatively the same, where the diode still acts like an open circuit. However, this time the line extends beyond V is equal to zero until. Um, vf and as such we add the condition or change the condition where vd must be less than or equal to vf common values for the turn on voltage for different semiconductor diodes is shown for silicon a common value or estimate for the turn on voltage or forward voltage drop is 0.7 volts while we have around 0.3 volts for germanium diodes. These values are related to the band gap value of the semiconductor and common doping concentrations used in these devices. One problem with the constant voltage drop model is that the voltage is constant regardless of the current. However, in a real diode, the voltage actually slightly increases with current. The easiest way to capture this behavior is to model the, the diode as a constant voltage source with a forward resistance. In this model at forward bias, the voltage at voltages beyond the forward voltage, the current increases linearly with voltage just like a resistor. However, this is not exactly and simply a resistor as the IV curve of a resistor must always pass through 
the origin. To move the plot along the horizontal, we need to add a voltage source in series with um, in series with the resistance and this voltage source must have a value equal to Vf. Um, however, note that the condition still remains that Id must be greater than or equal to zero and not negative um, since we don't have any negative currents um, beyond the y is equal to zero line. Thus, our condition remains that id must be greater than or equal to zero. The reverse bias model stays the same as our constant voltage drop model, where the diode still acts like an open circuit with id is equal to zero. And the condition is also the same, where the voltage must be less than vf. Here we will summarize the models we will use. Um, we will not use the third model and stick with the two simplest ones. In the first model, the diode, the ideal diode model, the circuit acts as an open when off and as a short when on or forward biased. Um, when redrawing the circuit, we can replace the diode with either an open circuit or a short circuit. Um, however, remember that, you uh, that we still need to check the conditions when using these models. With the off model, um, we fix the current at zero, so we need to check the voltage if it is less than or equal to zero. For the forward biased case or the on case, we fixed the voltage, so we need to check the current. For our second model, the constant voltage drop model, the forward bias case changed from 0 volts to some fixed forward voltage VF. We must therefore replace our diode with either an open circuit or a DC voltage source, whichever is the case if the diode is reversed or forward biased. Note that the plus terminal of the voltage source must be at the anode of the diode. For the reverse bias case, um, the change is in the condition where instead of comparing to 0 volts, we are now comparing to Vf instead. And as a final note, in either case, um, always check or verify if these conditions or assumptions are correct. You can follow these steps when analyzing a diode circuit according to the two models presented. The first step is to choose what approximation or model to use. Next, assume a state for each diode in the circuit. However, always make a wise guess to reduce the chances of having to redo the analysis. Take note of the current direction allowed by the diode and guess based on the given bias voltages if current should actually pass or not. Next, um, replace each diode with their equivalent circuit model and then solve the circuit. Since we just assumed the state of the diode, we must also check if the conditions or the assumptions are true. If the conditions for the assumed states or for all the assumed states for multiple diodes um, are met, then we are okay. However, if at least one of them is not met, then we have to redo the whole analysis with a different assumption. However, in cases where the task is to, say, identify the output voltage or some circuit property for varying voltage bias or for some varying resistor value or other circuit parameter, then we just check at which range is the assumption valid. And we'll um, see some examples of this later on.
Now, after doing these listed steps, you should be able to analyze diode circuits according to our models. However, always remember that um, these are just models and the actual behavior in real life circuits may vary. Um, just like how resistors in real life does not perfectly or exactly follow V is equal to IR. So it is always a good idea to eventually check if the circuit works as intended and how close you are to your targets and error margins. Okay, some tips in analysis. As we have just said, always know the diode allows only positive current to flow from the anode to cathode or from P side to N side, um, consistent to the direction of its arrow-like symbol. Remember also that the diode is a passive device, one that always dissipates power, it cannot supply power, and thus the current always enters the positive side of the voltage or the current always flow from a higher potential to a lower potential. If the higher voltage is at the anode or the end side, then um, the current must flow from N to P and this is um, not allowed by the diode and therefore the diode must be off or reverse biased. You may also get some intuition using the ideal diode approximation. Say you need to do the constant voltage drop model, then you may start imagining things using the first model first, then assume that most likely it is the case for the second model. Now, why is this recommended? Since the ideal diode approximation uh, or with the ideal diode approximation, you just need to replace the diode with an open or short. And thus, it is easier to imagine and quote-unquote guess the direction of currents in our heads without actually setting up any equation. Lastly, intuition gets better with familiarity and practice. Once you get introduced to common diode circuit configurations, then you would immediately have unexpected output or behavior in mind once you encounter them again. And of course, the more diode circuit analysis you do, then the easier the process will become eventually. Let's analyze some common diode circuits starting from diode logic circuits. And let's um, identify what type of logic gate this circuit here simulates. To make things easier, let's assume that the diodes are ideal, meaning they are just either open or short circuits. Um, let's also assume that the input voltages VA and VB are either 5 or 0 volts corresponding to logic 1 or logic 0. Next, to identify what logic gate this is, we should check the output for different input combinations. So to start, let's consider the case where our inputs are both 1. So when our inputs are both 1, then we input 5 volts for both VA and VB. Now note that um, if these two voltages here are 5 volts and this one is ground, then the natural flow of current will be from higher potential to lower potential and under that scenario the current flow is consistent with um, the direction of the diode and therefore the diode will allow that current to flow and therefore the diode must be on so we replace it with a short circuit to allow the current to flow from anode to cathode. Now since the diode acts as a short in this case we are considering then the output voltage is simply shorted to the input, which is 5 volts. So since the output is 5 volts, we can consider that output as a 1. Now, we cannot assume or conclude yet what type of logic gate this is based only on this single result. So let's consider another. This time, we consider the case when both inputs are 0 volts, and if this 
voltages are zero volts and this is ground then there is no voltage um, difference no potential difference and no current must flow and um, if no current must flow then we can uh, model the diodes as off and since no current is flowing no voltage drop on rl therefore whatever voltage here should be the voltage here and therefore the output must be zero volts for the last case we'll we'll consider um the input is one five volts and one zero volts and considering the five volts then um, since this is zero volts then current must still flow from five volts to zero volts and therefore we um, say that diode d1 is on um, and that makes the output node shorted to five volts and so the output voltage is five volts now what happens here um, since the output voltage is five volts the potential at the cathode is higher than the potential at the anode then the natural flow of current must be from 5 volts to 0 volts but the diode won't allow that and will um, that makes the diode off okay to be able to do that and so in this case the input is 1 0 and the output is 1 when we, if we reverse the input 0 volts and 5 volts then um, the output voltage will still be shorted to 5 volts and this one will be off and therefore um, given this scenario we can conclude that the diode acts like an OR gate since um, the output is always 1 except only when all inputs are 0 now what happens if we assume the constant voltage drop um, if that is the case then there will be a voltage drop from anode to cathode and instead the output voltages um, for the case that um, the output is 1 will be say 4.3 volts if vf is 0.7 volts so instead of 5 volts the output voltage will be around 4.7 3 volts if we assume a 0.7 voltage drop um, at every on diode for the next circuit um, consider this one let's identify again what type of logic gate this is um, however note that this time the inputs are connected to the cathode instead of the anode and the other end is now connected to 5 volts through a resistor instead of ground now how will this work um, let's still assume that the diodes are ideal um, if we start again with the case that both input voltages are 5 volts or 1 then this is 5 volts 5 volts 5 volts um, all end terminals are in 5 volts and therefore no current must flow and we can model the diodes as open and with that no current is flowing through RL and therefore there is no voltage drop whatever the voltage here should be the voltage here 5 volts and since um, they are just both in 5 volts then no current should flow okay so since our output is 5 volts then we can consider that as a 1 for the next case when both um, input voltages are zero now the current can flow from 5 volts down to 0 volts and since we assume that the diode is ideal then there is no voltage drop and the output is 0 volts note that this expected current flow from 5 to 0 is consistent to the orientation of the diode so the diode can be on in this um, in this case so note our output now when the both inputs are zero is zero for the third case we consider when one is five volts and one is zero volts and um, when this is zero volts it allows current to flow from five to zero 
and since um, this diode is on then the output is shorted to zero now note that if this node here is zero then this node here is zero and we have five volts and zero volts then current should normally flow rightwards in this direction five to zero however that direction um, that current is not allowed by this diode so instead um, the diode will act as an open circuit and not allow that current to flow so our output remains at zero volts okay and um, by observation we know that um, even if we interchange these two the output will still be zero so all the outputs are zero except when all inputs are one and thus this one acts like an AND gate now what happens if we assume a constant forward um, voltage drop of 0.7 note that in this first case the diodes are off so um, the output will still remain at 5 volts however in this cases um, the forward voltage drop is from anode to cathode and therefore there will be some voltage drop from from this point to this point um, but since the cathode side is grounded then this will be forced to be 0.7 if the forward voltage drop is 0.7 Next, we'll um, analyze the circuit um, we call the half-wave rectifier. Um, so we connect our diode um, from input to output um, in this direction and put some load resistance here. Let's assume first that the diodes are ideal. And then if the input is positive, then current would most likely flow from the positive voltage whatever that value is down to ground okay so um, the diode will allow that current flow and since we are assuming an ideal diode in that case then v out will simply be equal to v in since at that point the diode acts like a short circuit however for the case of um, a negative input then this voltage here is at the input is lower than the um, than ground then the normal flow of current will be from ground down to that lower potential but that flow of current is not allowed by this diode so instead um, this diode will be open and if that is open no current will flow here and therefore there is no voltage at the resistor and if there is no voltage at the resistor then whatever voltage at this point here should be the voltage at this point here so when the input is negative then our output is simply zero volt And that is captured by this equation when the input is positive. Um, since we are showing ideal diode, again, this one acts like a short. So the output is simply equal to the input. But when the input is negative, then the output is simply zero. Now, if we say input a time varying signal to this um, circuit, say a sinusoid, with some frequency and 4 volts in magnitude um, we consider first check first the um, portions where we um, separated our cases our input so we note at the points where um, the input is positive and where the inputs are negative 
So let's say this is case 1 and this is case 2. So if we look at the graph, then um, all the portions will, where the input is positive is case 1. And the cases where the input is negative is case 2. Therefore, when we plot the output for case 1, we follow this formula here that V out is equal to V in and that applies to case 1. However, for case 2, um, the output voltage must be 0. And so for case 2, from this point to this point, the output must be 0. And so, same also on this case. Since this is case 2, the output at that range must be 0. And so, given this, um, um, the output is simply copied on the positive cycle and zeroed on the um, negative half cycle and thus the name half wave rectifier since um, it only allows um, half wave rectified to be outputted. Now say if what if we want to rectify or sorry what if we consider a more realistic um, model, a constant voltage model, then um, for the current to start flowing, um, which means that the diode is on, then the voltage must first reach the um, turn on voltage and that is VF. So let's assume that VF is equal to 0.7 and um, if the diode is on, let's say that again is our case 1, then this should look like some voltage source with a value 0.7 and if that is the case, um, this voltage source connects V in and V out. Therefore, 0.7 is equal to V in minus V out or V out is equal to V in minus 0.7, which is in this case VF. And that only happens when um, the current is allowed to flow. So VI must be um, greater than VF. Now, how did we end up specifically with this condition? Um, Going back, our condition for on diodes is that ID is greater than or equal to zero. Assuming that the diode is on, the current ID must be directed this way. And the only path for that current is to flow this way. Now, therefore, this is ID and this is ID as well. Now, if ID must be greater than or equal to 0, then for this current across the resistor to be positive, then V out must be greater than or equal to 0. However, in this case, V out is equal to V in minus VF. And thus, we end up with this. We end up with this equation where VI is greater than VF. For the case when the diode is off, um, if the diode is off, then there is no current, and if there is no current, then, this, then there is no voltage drop across this resistor, and the output must be equal to 0 volts. Now, how did we get this? Um, condition, the condition for off um, for off diodes um, in the constant voltage model is that VD, 
must be less than Vf. However, Vd in this case is V in minus V out. But we have already shown that V out must be 0 volts. So V in is less than Vf is the alternate um, is the equivalent expression. Okay. So next, what happens to our plot given that um, this is our case 1 and case 2? So now we are dividing our input voltage, Vi. So note that our y-axis here is input. And let's say we identify where 0.7 occurs. So let's say this one is 0.7 approximately. So everything here. is case 1 and thus case um, case 2 is from this point to this point. So now when we plot our our output voltage uh, what we can also do is for example we check the peak uh, for the peak voltage, um, this is 4 volts, and since that is case 1, um, we subtract we subtract by 0 0.7, and so we get the peak to be just 0.3. Now, for this longer portion here, for case 2, the output is 0. Okay, note that this um, portion that the diode is off is now longer or more than half of the period and the time that it is on is less than half a period and aside from that, the peak voltage is also decreased. So this one is a more um, realistic output. Now, if you want to, say, rectify on both sides then we can use this um, full wave rectifier um, how does this work so this is the expected ideal output um, by ideal we mean that the diode simply acts as on or off or short circuit and open circuit so when the voltage is positive um, the current must leave the positive side of the source and enter back to its negative side. Since um, this portion here is purely passive, then it must um, consume power or consume power while the voltage source provides power. Now, if that is the case, the current must flow from the positive side, then it must decide at this point where it wants to go but since D4 is the opposite direction, then current will be flowing through D1. Now, from this point, um, the current cannot flow through D3. Therefore, current will flow this way. And this ground here is just um, some reference um, defining that this node is ground. Or zero volts and note that the negative side of Vs is not ground okay so those two are not connected so at this point the current cannot go to D4 since that will uh, make an make the loop go back or say not create a loop a closed loop so instead the current will flow through D2 and current cannot flow again through D3 since that will not create a loop. So it will go back to this point, back to the negative side. And now note that the current entered the plus side of this defined voltage here. So the voltage will be positive. And since we are assuming that um, diodes when on are shorted, then 
what appears across V out is simply Vs. So the input is 4 volts peak, so the output is 4 volts peak. However, when the um, voltage, when the input voltage is negative, so the, cur the positive current must now flow from this side. So let's say the voltage is negative. So say we have here 4 volts. That is the same, sorry, negative 4 volts. So that is the same as just having this one with some positive 4 volts. So let's say we stick to this second one. And in this case, um, the current should now flow from the positive terminal. Now, it will decide where it can pass. D3 allows it to pass. It cannot pass through D1, so it goes this way. It cannot go back through D2. D4 allows it to pass through. It cannot go back to D1. So, current flows this direction. Now, um, in this direction, um, current again enters this side where the plus side of the voltage is defined and thus we get another positive voltage on the negative cycle. And thus this shows how um, this full wave rectifier works. However, if we consider a constant voltage source with Vf is equal to 0.7, then every time the current makes a complete loop, then um, it, will, it would need to pass through two on diodes and therefore there will be two forward voltage drops. One is 0.7 each, so the total will be 1.4. That's why our output is actually smaller. And also that makes um, the on time much shorter since the input must exceed 1.4 volts before it can start um, conducting. So there is the, some dead time um, when the voltage is, when the input voltage is small. Okay, another um, possible usage of the diode is um, on peak detectors. So here we have a capacitor at the output side. And let's say the, the output starts initially with 0 volts. So at this case, when the input is negative, current will not be allowed to flow by the diode. And so the capacitor will retain its 0 volts. However, when the input starts rising, assuming that the diode is ideal, then current will start to flow and that current will charge up the capacitor and if the diode acts like a short circuit, then V in will simply be equal to V out. So let's say um, that at this point, the diode was able to charge up to say 2 volts. Now what happens when the diode, when the input voltage starts going down? If the input voltage starts going down, since we already have 2 volts at this node, then the diode will not allow that current to flow backwards. And so current will not flow and the capacitor will not discharge, maintaining its, rec its recent maximum value. And that should look like this one. So when the input rises, um, the capacitor stores charge, but when the input um, input goes down, the diode um, prevents the capacitor to discharge back to the input level. Now with a load resistor, assuming that the uh, input goes down. Uh, well, let's focus first on this portion. On this portion, let's assume a constant voltage drop, Vd on. So here we 
refer it as, as some um, VD on. Um, when the input voltage is not yet VD on, the output will not yet, um, or the diode will not yet allow current to flow. So the output will still be zero. However, as it increases, the output will also increase, but with an offset equal to VD on. So the output will be slightly lower. Now, when the input goes down, the diode will not allow the capacitor to discharge. So current here will not be allowed. However, since we have this resistor here, then current can still flow out of the capacitor through the resistor and it will start discharging. So that is the discharging portion here. Now, when the input voltage um, has risen such that the diode is turned on again, then the voltage will again start increasing. And when the voltage input voltage decreases, the diode will be off and the capacitor will be discharged by the load resistor. And um, in this case, we know that at steady state, say we just go back to this green line periodically, um, we will have some ripple output voltage VR, which is um, in this case, the difference, sorry, the ripple voltage should be actually be here. This is the ripple voltage. And that ripple voltage is dependent on how fast the resistor discharges the capacitor and how much time is it is um, available for discharging. So the faster the frequency of the input is, so the less time for the resistor to discharge. And we expect um, less ripple at that point. So if we vary the capacitor C1, so the larger the value of C1, the harder it will be for the resistor to discharge. So from this point here of peak value, um, the larger capacitor will, um, given the same amount of time, will discharge less as compared to a very small capacitor, which the resistor can easily discharge. So say we want a flatter um, output, then we can use a larger capacitor. Although that larger capacitor will need more charge or current from our input voltage. Okay, so if we look back, our peak detector actually looks like a half-wave rectifier with an output capacitor. So I just interchanged here the position of the capacitor and the resistor. So we can also imagine the output of the peak detector as the output of the half-wave rectifier but with the addition of the output resistor here, um, the output is not allowed to discharge fast or go down fast. Now, um, our expected periodic output looks like this one with some ripple. And let's say we want to eliminate that ripple. Um, we can connect that to a regulator circuit, which um, basically tries to maintain the output voltage. Um, this is a Zener regulator since we use here a Zener diode. So this one is the symbol for a Zener diode. Um, the symbol actually looks like its IV curve where the Zener diode looks like a normal um, normal diode with an exponential increase on the on side but also have a breakdown region on the 
other end. So if we look at this, um, the two ends, then here we can say that um, the diode acts like a constant voltage source and at this portion as well, um, when the voltage is negative enough, then um, the voltage also acts like a voltage source, although steeper in slope. So this um, one here, the breakdown region actually looks more like an ideal voltage source than this one. So Zener diodes are um, have steeper slopes at the um, left portion. That's why the diode here is inverted. And assuming the diode here, D1, operates at this portion where it is in breakdown, then, then we can say that um, that diode simply acts like a voltage source. And if we input um, this rippling voltage here, and that is, say, positive enough, say this is time, this is V in, say that is positive enough um, with respect to the diode's breakdown voltage. And so the voltage at the input side actually looks um, very negative with respect to the Zener diode's cathode. So note that this one is the cathode. And therefore, the, the diode the Zener diode will simply act like a voltage source. However, um, for the voltage to be much negative, then there must be some voltage difference and the output will be much flatter and the, um, the ripple can be, can be eliminated or minimized. So that is actually how it generally looks like for your power supply. So this is one approach where we have our AC input, which is then fed to a rectifier, full wave rectifier, because both um, cycles are rectified. Then um, it is passed through a filter. In our case, um, the capacitor is the one acting like a filter. And then um, we can use a voltage regulator to flatten out the curve and reduce the ripple before feeding it to our load. So the load will see uh, seemingly flat input voltage, whereas the power actually came from a, um, an AC source. Now, aside from the digital logic circuits and um, DC power supplies, um, there are other diode circuits that can be used. So you have voltage clippers. Um, it basically clips the output voltage beyond a certain point to maintain safe levels. Um, voltage restorers. So um, if you may have noticed um, in our logic gate, the voltage levels are um, degraded. So we can also use diodes to revert them back to their um, ideal voltage levels. We can also use voltage doublers um, and actually say the clipper, the peak, uh, sorry, the peak detector can also be used in communication. So the peak detector can be used in our AM radio since AM depends on amplitude. Okay. And So that's it for this um, lecture. We'll just summarize. Um, so the diode is a two-terminal electronic component that allows the conduction of current in one direction only. Um, it can be modeled using the Shockley diode equation with an exponential function. So I0 is the reverse saturation current, which is a function of the material temperature and um, doping. Vt is the thermal voltage, Kt over Q. And uh, we have said that this can be too um, complex for hand calculations, although it 
we're not saying that it is not possible to compute, um, but it is just, say, harder. So we use equivalent models with simpler circuit elements made up of voltage sources, open circuit, short circuits, resistors, etc. However, there are certain conditions uh, which must be checked and verified um, before using the model or using the final result or verifying the final result. Now, there are um, conditions that must be checked since we are basically dividing the IV curve into two portions. However, that is not needed in the shock equation as this one is a unified model where it captures both um, the on state and the off state. So that's it. Thank you very much.